It is a little known fact that by the end of the First World War, over a million troops from undivided India, including Gorkha regiments, had served overseas with Allied forces. According to the records of the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, more than 74,000 were killed. Their graves and memorials can be found in many countries around the globe, wherever Indian troops were stationed or fighting. If I should die, think only this of me, that there's some corner of a foreign field that is forever India. On the gentle English hills of the South Downs, overlooking the seaside resort of Brighton, stands a memorial known as the Chhatri, a word meaning umbrella in Hindi, Punjabi and Urdu. Chhatris have been used as memorials to the dead for centuries in India. The Brighton Chhatri is dedicated to Indian soldiers who died in the First World War. How many people pass by its marble dome and pause to wonder, why is it there? On the 26th of September 2010, nearly 90 years after it was first unveiled by the then Prince of Wales, a group of people meet together at the Chhatri. They come to witness the dedication of a new screen wall built by the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. They come to remember. The wall is inscribed with the names of 53 Indian soldiers who died in the First World War. Well, it's, it's a very proud occasion. It's fa fantastic. It's proud. We feel very proud and very grateful uh, to these people who fought in the First World War for our freedoms. That's why we can stand here and talk to you so, as free men. So it's a hugely significant day. About 12,000 Indian soldiers who were wounded on the Western Front were brought to the Brighton area between 1914 and 1916 to be treated for their injuries. Notable buildings, such as the Royal Pavilion, were converted into military hospitals. With sensitivity quite remarkable at the time, careful arrangements were made to provide for the different religious and caste requirements of the Hindus, Sikhs and Muslims who were treated there. The scrupulous attention to detail extended to the funeral arrangements for those who died. 53 Hindus and Sikhs were cremated on a specially built funeral ghat at the site on which the Chhatri now stands. One of those men was Manta Singh. With extraordinary bravery, he saved the life of his officer, Captain Henderson, who lay wounded in no man's land. This led to a friendship between the two men's grandsons, which continues to this day. What we are told is he was bringing him back in a wheelbarrow. Then he got wounded as well. And uh, his wounds were so severe, he was brought to hospital in uh, Brighton, Royal Pavilion, which was converted as a hospital. Unfortunately, his wound didn't heal, and uh, he passed away in March 1915. It's a remarkable story, and what I don't think many people realize is the debt which we owe to the Indian Army for holding the line in 1915 when the Germans were about to break through. And the Indian army was thrown in um, into very difficult circumstances and uh, really saved the day. And I think it's a story which needs to be told and repeated because we owe them an enormous debt of gratitude. Muslim soldiers who died in British hospitals also received burial rites according to their religion. Some were taken to Woking to a new cemetery near to the Shah Jahan Mosque, some to Brookwood Military Cemetery. There, in a fusion of Muslim practices with British military traditions, they were interred, and a bugler played the last post. One young man's long journey from India was, tragically, to end at Brookwood Cemetery. Muhammad Sarwar grew up in the Punjab and, like many young men, sought adventure and a life outside his ancestral village by joining the 19th Lancers, 
Fane's horse. Mohammed only survived for eight short months in Flanders. Trench warfare made cavalry charges virtually impossible, so the men left their horses behind the lines and served as infantry. It is not certain how or where Mohammed was injured, but it is quite possible that it was during the Battle of Neuve Chapelle, the same battle in which Manta Singh and Captain Henderson were injured in March 1915. By April 1915, Mohammed was in the Kitchener Hospital in Brighton, now the General Hospital. There he died, two months later, not on the field of battle like so many other Muslims, but from typhoid. He was just 19. His headstone in Brookwood Cemetery reads, For God we are, and to God we go, which comes from the Quran. Wounded Gurkhas too were treated in British hospitals in the course of and after the First World War. Adam Hoj Rai of the 7th Gurkha Rifles a regiment which fought so valiantly in the Middle East, survived the war, but then succumbed to the flu pandemic that started in 1918. He died in the Horton War Hospital in Epsom and is commemorated within a special plot at Epsom Cemetery. The Gurkha Museum at Winchester's Peninsula Barracks recounts the fascinating story of the men from Nepal, whose exploits have made them famous the world over. Um, in the First World War, he uh, joined as a volunteer. The country was less than four million in those days, and 120,000 of them joined the army uh, as volunteers to fight for the British cause. That tradition of Gurkhas serving in the British army continues to this day. Modern Gurkhas, uh, they are, uh, were deployed in Afghanistan and uh, they are fighting for, uh, for there. And uh, we lose uh, many of our Gurkha colleagues and um, they have sacrificed their life in Afghanistan. And uh, I still remember them and our battalion and we're keeping their pictures in our um, battalion quarter guard. The Battle of Neuve Chapelle was of particular significance to Indian troops. They made up half the Allied attacking force, and after three days, they had suffered over 4,000 casualties. Many are commemorated at the Neuve Chapelle Memorial, including 39 men now known to have been cremated at the Chhatri near Brighton. Prince Charles and the Duchess of Cornwall recently visited Neuve Chapelle to pay their respects to the men commemorated there. Pupils and teachers from Allerton Grain School in Leeds also attended. We were telling the students before we came that it'd be a once in a lifetime opportunity. And I sometimes think that bounces on, on, on sort of cold walls. But now that they're here and we're talking to them after the event, they're all just so pumped up about it. And, and I think it's meant an awful lot. And the preparation that they did prior to coming out revealed knowledge that I think none of us knew about the number of Indians and Sikhs who, who were killed in the war. We weren't aware of that. Very brave coming from a very hot country to a like, to a place that had a, that suffered from its very bitter winter for the first time. It's quite a unique experience to come and see a war memorial and, and of course to meet the Prince, Prince of Wales and the Duchess of Cornwall of course. But it's a special occasion because of all the Indian soldiers that did actually die in the First World War. It's not really heard of. The memorial bears the following inscription. To the honour of the Army of India, which fought in France and Belgium, 1914 to 1918, and in perpetual remembrance of those of their dead, whose names are here recorded, and who have no known grave. It was designed to honour India, its culture and traditions. The column recalls the pillars of Ashoka, and on the top is a lotus capital, the Star of India and the Imperial Crown. On either side, two carved tigers guard the memorial. Within the walls are two chhatris, similar to that near Brighton, which often attracts school parties keen to learn of its significance. Downlands Community School, Hassocks, involved in a cultural exchange with the Ellen Sharma Memorial School in Chennai, India, included a visit to the chhatri as part of their research into Anglo-Indian history. I think the chhatri is really important because a lot of people, um, a lot of men and in the war but if they're not remembered then it's almost like 
they fought for nothing because they were fighting for the peace of their countries and our countries. So if they're not remembered, then it's almost like what we have now, like freedom, is all due to them, but we're just forgetting it and taking advantage of it. And it's special that um, they do this for the Indian soldiers because uh, it's the first time they fought outside of India and um, it's something different for uh, both Britain and India to be involved in. I think it's very important. It's important because, you know, the unknown have become known and we can now respect their memories and their sacrifices. You have a name and a face to those who died over here, who were, who were, who were cremated over here. It's important for us. I believe there is a very strong bond. They fought and they died together. There was a great code of honour. I think the Indian word is izzat, which means self-esteem. And that was the most important thing. I think it was that sense of duty, honour, responsibility, which is something perhaps we forget today. But what isn't forgotten today is the sacrifice made by so many Indians. At thousands of sites in 150 countries, the Commonwealth War Graves Commission works tirelessly to maintain their memory, ensuring there is always some corner of a foreign field that is forever India.